Awesome. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today. We are here with another ACE Spotlight, se spotlight session. Uh, and we are talking about the hot topic of the day, AlphaFold. Um, I'm very fortunate today to be joined by uh, Sid, Matteo, and Chris, uh, who have agreed to join us on a very short notice to discuss this uh, awesome piece of work. Um, unfortunately, the blog post that was written about it, there is no publication yet. And the blog post is a little vague. So a lot of what we are going to discuss is going to be our best guesses about uh, what has been done and what is uh, coming up. And, but hopefully uh, that will provide some context about uh, about what, what has been achieved. So I'm going to quickly uh, tell you a bit about our speakers today. Uh, I'm obviously not an expert on this topic, so I had to pull on some connections to bring in a few experts. Um, while my page is loading, uh, I am going to quickly uh, tell you about our speakers. Or maybe instead of that, I'll ask you to introduce yourself. How about that? All right, Sid, please go first. Yeah, happy to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sid Elmer, and I'm a computational chemist. I currently work at Biosymmetrics as a data scientist. And uh, my background in this area is uh, I worked with Vijay Pandey at uh, Stanford University. And uh, my PH dissertation was on protein folding of non-biological polymers and, of course, contributed to his, uh, uh, his platform, Folding at Home. Perfect. Uh, Mathieu, do you want to go next? Sure. So. Yes, I'm Matteo Aldeghi, and uh, right now I'm a postdoc at the Vector Institute in Toronto. Um, my background is in computational biophysics slash chemistry. So during my PhD, I worked more on computational approaches for drug design uh, and a bit of protein design as well. Uh, and broadly now I work more on machine learning approaches for chemistry and biochemistry. Perfect. And Chris? Hi, everyone. My name is Christopher Ng. I'm a co-founder at a Toronto-based biotechnology startup called Protein Cure. And our company focuses on the design of proteins for therapeutic purposes with our partners in biotechnology companies in Big Pharma. And my background is in computational biology as well, specifically on protein structure, dynamics, and understanding how proteins function. And I had studied at the University of Toronto where I focused on very specific proteins and understand their relevance to health and disease. And I have a longstanding interest in machine learning as well as techniques such as these for protein structure determination and other applications in drug discovery. Perfect, and Karim. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Karim. I'm a data scientist uh, working at BMO. Um, previously, I did my PhD and postdoc in computational fluid dynamics at ETH Zurich. And my current interests are uh, machine learning using graph neural networks. Perfect. Thank you so much. So uh, as, <clears throat> as we said earlier, there is a lot of unknowns about this work. Uh, but let's get a bit of a background on what are we talking about at all. Uh, so the, the, the main biological question that we're that or DeepMind has tried to answer here is protein folding. Uh, so maybe I can ask Sid to give us a background there on protein folding. Uh, what what is it and what is the importance of it? And I think there is or there was this 50 year old conjecture that uh, essentially the 3D structure of protein determines its properties. So you know, can you walk us through that? Like, what is the thinking there? And why do we care about portrait folding so much? Yeah, happy to give a little introduction to the problem itself and a little introduction to uh, protein structure and how that could, um, as, as you said, the conjecture is the protein structure determines the protein's function. Um, so at a, at a basic level, the question that we're asking right here is given a protein sequence of amino acids, 
can you predict the structure, the three-dimensional structure of that protein? Um, that is uh, the, the primary um, question for protein structure prediction. Uh, protein folding is a little bit higher uh, on top of that. It could include how does the protein actually reach that folded state. Um, but the fundamental question that alpha fold was trying to address as I mentioned, given a protein sequence, can you determine the three-dimensional structure? That's a very difficult question. Um, if you think about it in terms of mathematics, you have a one-dimensional representation of a protein and you want to be able to then predict a three-dimensional structure. Um, in most mathematical applications, you know, we think about reducing the dimensionality, say from three dimensions to two dimensions. And we can visualize that in our brains, but to go from one dimension to three dimension is bet it's it's pretty much an undetermined or it's an ill ill posed mathematical question. And so there is something fundamental about proteins that encodes a three dimensional structure from a one dimensional sequence, and uh, from a scientific viewpoint that is a very challenging problem. And the fact that AlphaFold has now has a solution or they've claimed that there is a solution to that problem is, is very, uh, it's a huge uh, win for the scientific community. I forgot to unmute myself. All right, so uh, <laughs> as you pointed out, it is an extremely challenging problem to solve. Uh, definitely there are no good analytical solutions for it. So we had to do a lot of computational methods to address this problem. So Matteo, maybe you can walk us through what are like some of the common techniques that we've been using to tackle this problem. Uh, and, you know, just give us a background on that. Yeah, sure. So I guess one way to see it is that we can go with two different approaches. Uh, one is more like a physics based approach where you say, well, I have a, a sequence of amino acids and I can model where all of these atoms are and all of the interaction between these atoms and then try to simulate the folding problem. And again, this can be computationally quite expensive, but it has been done for some proteins. Um, and then you can see how it folds and then it will reach a, a state um, that is the folded protein. On the other hand, you can go for more statistics based methods or more looking what has already been solved. Um, so like for instance, let's say homology modeling is a very common approach when then um, you look for sequences that are very similar. So you know that you might have a similar protein that is present in another organism, in another animal. And then you can model, you know, you, you roughly know that your structure should be close to that one. And then you can use it as a template. So this is information that really helps you solve this problem. Uh, but of course, if you have a sequence that is completely different, then it, it becomes challenging. And then you have uh, all sorts of, you know, approaches that are in between the two. Uh, again, you can extract also statistical information from sequence alignment. So you can see again, and this is also what alpha fold is used. So if you can see that pair of amino acids have um, are consistently mutated together, then you can you can see that there is a correlation between the two of them. And you, you can sort of infer that if there is a correlation in the sequence, there, there might be also an interaction in 3D space. So it gives you any more information. But again, I would say that you can have this kind of two approaches, one that follows more like simulating the physics of the problem, and the other one that follows more a statistics-based approach, looking at what has been solved before and can we extract information from there. And then you have everything in between because also AlphaFold, I think for some of the steps, they do refine their model based on some of established physics-based models of the proteins. But let's say at a, at a high level, um, you can go in, in these two directions, I would say, uh, primarily. Perfect. Uh, so let's talk a little about the context where AlphaFold came out. Uh, so the news about AlphaFold 2, uh, the recent work, there was a, a an earlier one, uh, I believe, a few years ago. Uh, it was in the, I guess, Chris, before you joined us, we were talking with Sid and Matteo that is it is it a competition? Is it a collaboration? So, you know, CASP is where the, the results were announced. Can you tell us a bit about what is CASP about? Uh, and maybe a bit of a background in, backgrounder on what AlphaFold, like the original AlphaFold was uh, and what that achieved. Sure, happy to talk about that. So 
Uh, the protein structure prediction problem has a great, you know, driving force behind it, which is these type of competitions. Not every field has a, such a well-defined problem uh, that you could encapsulate in sort of um, something like a competition. So the community of scientific uh, researchers working on the problem of protein structure prediction came together and through, you know, hard work and lots of grants came up with um, a blind prediction problem where um, scientists across the world could submit and apply their computational method, whether it be physics-based or knowledge and statistics-based, like Matteo was talking about, all on an equal playing field for problems that, for sequences of proteins for which there is no structure in any database known. Um, it gives you a little a sense, just a little bit of the context of this, is that getting a 3D structure of a protein is a very hard problem um, experimentally and in the lab. So this is a problem where we don't have data set sizes of you know hundreds or thousands of proteins. We're lucky if we can get um, scientists to you know come together and submit to one of these blind competitions and make this a real challenge because. A lot of times, actually, known protein structures are also similar to ones we've already seen. So <laughs> there's really a hard problem in that, as Matteo was talking about, we could try to make a competition to predict a 3D structure of a protein, and we already know something so similar to it. And it really wouldn't be a hard competition in that case. Um, protein structures can be quite similar, even if their sequences are only different in a few places. But in general, that's the idea behind it, the critical assessment of the structure Okay, I think I got the cast back and I'm wrong, but <laughs> it's a critical assessment of protein structure prediction methods, and it's been going on since 1994, essentially. So before AlphaFold, there's now decade or two methods to do this, and well, certainly researchers have come a long way, but AlphaFold wouldn't represent the first deep learning method applied to the problem. Um, you know, machine learning methods from the simplest neural networks, as soon as these methods are being created, they're being applied to simplified problems like um, secondary structure prediction. It's not quite 3D structure prediction, but it's still challenging. And it's amazing to see quite the the, the leap, uh, the diff, the, the uh, improvements between the type of deep learning methods applied in AlphaFold 1 and 2 versus you know the rest of the methods applied in this competition. Um, so. I should say that, you know, give a lot of researchers across the world credit that there have been many uh, exciting methods applied, but none have thus far achieved the type of performance of this method. That's a great segue to the next question. Speaking of performance, uh, how do we measure it? Uh, so what's, uh, uh, like for this competition and in general, like for, for you know, day-to-day -day research that, that scientists are doing, uh, how do we know if we are getting close or not? Uh, but you maybe you can talk to that a bit. Yeah, sure. So I guess again there are many different ways of doing this, but at the most fundamental level, you have a uh, you know the experimentally solved structure. Um, it gives you let's say a, a a model, so the 3D coordinates. So you have x, y, z coordinates for all of the atoms in the protein, which uh, again depending on the size, might be you know thousands of atoms. And then you have you try to predict the coordinates of each of these atoms. So effectively, one way to see how, how good your model is is to compute some distance measure between you know the coordinates uh, in the in the model in the prediction and the coordinates you know experimentally derived. Um, and then you can do this by calculating the root mean square error across all of the possible positions. Uh, something else that people tend to do is to focus on a subset of these atoms. So this is one of the main difference that you might see. Um, so the main backbone of the protein uh, you know, is only like a subset of these atoms that really gives you the overall fold. And sometimes all, only this car the alpha carbon, so only a subset of the atoms are considered, which gives you the idea, is the fold roughly correct? Um, but then you can also consider all of, all of the atoms. And another very common measure is this uh, global uh, distance score. Um, which again is based on how close are you, uh, you know, in your how close is your model to the uh, experimental structure, and in this case, you're basically asking how many of my atoms are within a certain cutoff, uh, you know, from the from the real, um, you know, from from the real structure. So if you have like a 90%, um, you know, uh, distance score for a cutoff of two angstrom, it means 90% of your atoms are within two angstrom uh, of the experimental structure. 
But basically, all of these are measures of distance between your um, predicted model and the experimentally derived model. And maybe something to mention here is that also the experimentally derived model is not 100%, um, you know, there, there might be small deviations there as well. So there is an error in the experimental model as well. So it's, it's the error is much smaller typically than, you know, in uh, predicted models, let's say, but you have some uncertainty also in those positions as well. So there is a lower bound of or upper bound of performance that one can achieve. Excellent. So you're going to move to a part that you're going to talk more details about the claims, the methodology, and impact. Uh, and you know, going forward, since we got a bit of background, I'm going to invite all my panelists to just jump in uh, if you have you know any point of view to add. I'm going to address a specific panelist, but please uh, please do contribute as we go. Uh, so speaking of performance, uh, one of the claims that they made is that their performance, the root mean score uh, that they're getting is, is on order of an angstrom, which is roughly the size of an atom. And that's quite mind blowing. Uh, I don't know what the other performances are like, but the title of the blog post was quite interesting. They said solving a 50 year, uh, 50 year old problem. So said, I would love to hear your thoughts. Like, is it solved? Like, or maybe the better question is, what have they solved and what they have not solved yet? Oh, did you lose it? Okay, sorry okay. about that. Having a hard time unmuting myself. Yes. So uh, what? that's a, a, a good question there. So what is it that they have solved? Um, as I mentioned in my first introduction, um, the, the very specific question is, if you're given a protein sequence, can you predict the three-dimensional structure of the protein? Um, I would say in that particular instance, that problem for all practical purposes has been solved with the results of alpha fold. Now, obviously there are uh, further refinements, uh, further uh, advancements that they can make to address, you know, perhaps there are some proteins that may not be as amenable to, to the problem, but uh, for uh, globular proteins, um, soluble proteins, I would, uh, I would, agree with the uh, uh, assessment of the uh, of the committee that that alpha fold uh, especially the second iteration of alpha fold solves the problem um, you know in protein folding there's another uh, problem that's known as the inverse folding problem so that kind of turns it around it says if you're given a three-dimensional structure or a fold can you design a sequence or multiple sequences that would then fold to that particular structure. In my opinion, uh, that's a little bit more of a challenging problem. And I also feel like it would be a better demonstration of a solution to the protein folding problem. Um, if we have a given sequence and we can say what the structure is, that's a very useful thing. But if then somebody in some biotechnological application ha has an idea to be able to design some new protein or some new enzyme that's never been before seen in the natural world. And you can specify in order for this uh, particular application to be successful, it has to have this particular fold. And then you can turn around and you can, uh, you can design a sequence or a set of sequence that could actually fold to that particular structure and be an active functional protein. I think for, in my opinion, that is a better demonstration of a real solution to the protein folding problem. Um, you know, obviously uh, there are multiple levels of any uh, scientific, uh, scientific uh, discovery or um, endeavor and I'd say if you think about this as an onion, you've we've kind of peeled off the first layer of that onion. You know, there are other layers of the onion which are deeper, 
um, that present new challenges, um, that present uh, other obstacles, and perhaps um, you need better methods to be able to peel away that next layer of, uh, of the onion. But um, as far as the, the specific claims that they have made, that they have solved this problem, on that first layer of the onion, I would say that yes, they have done it. Perfect. Uh, does anybody want to add anything? Yeah, maybe like briefly, I think it's a, it's a very good point. So I think the design of protein, and I mean, Chris might have some uh, comment here as well. It's, you know, it's potentially one of the biggest applications. Um, however, again, like when you design a protein, your sequences are not very similar to the one that you find, uh, you know, in the protein uh, data bank, you know, on your templates or, you know, proteins that are naturally, that have naturally evolved in different organisms. So it would be interesting to see how good you know, alpha fold two is at folding proteins um, that might be very different from the ones that are used, um, you know, in training effectively. Uh, maybe, uh, Chris, you can help me answer some of the YouTube questions that are re related to to what we're talking about. Uh, so, uh, Mario is asking, uh, is what they have done? I think said address that a bit, but maybe you can provide a different point of view. Like, is is what they have done here possible to be applied to all types of proteins? Uh, and uh, Pranjal is asking if, you know, given what has happened here and probably what Matteo said, are we at a position that we can engineer proteins with particular uh, properties? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely. And in my role uh, in a protein therapeutics design company, this type of discovery is very interesting to us as far as that translational aspect towards drug discovery. And I would say that, you know, as we've seen yet, it's really not intended to be or at the stage that we can do protein engineering, the inverse folding problem, designing really those therapeutic proteins to be those type of drug binders or, um, you know, f to maybe self-assemble and to larger protein complexes for the delivery of drugs. There's lots of great opportunities there that this method is a stepping zone towards in that, you know, onion. And, you know, you know, I'm excited about the potential for it to move to those stages because it seems to me conceptually some of the methods, um, you know, could be applied. You know, one of the most important things for the applications for engineering binders is the study of a protein-protein interface. So it's not just one protein, it's the complex of two proteins. So in principle, the, a lot of the you know, physics and the knowledge of the protein biophysics we've learned in you know, a, a deep neural network can potentially really, really have benefits for that. You know, the inside or, of a protein or the full of a protein could tell you a lot about how two proteins interact. And I think that has you know, useful applications, but you know, being in this space and close to this, I notice all these little gotchas and caveats where this method really couldn't be applied. For example, there's, you know, a large class of modifications made to the natural amino acids, post-translational modifications, you know, after a protein folds, it gets modified by the body and by cells. And, you know, that's just another layer of complexity. Biology is really layering on the weirdness. Maybe you've heard about the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein being heavily glycosylated. It's really covered in sugars rather than it is a bare protein. So understanding the bare protein itself really doesn't understand you how to help you understand how it really looks in the body because it's really just such a you know a challenging thing and especially protein dynamics. I mean this is another aspect I think the DeepMind team is really particularly interested in because because uh, proteins themselves are not a single static structure in our bodies. There's thermal fluctuations and protein dynamics and movements of proteins that really govern how they function as little machines in our body and how therapeutics can then modify that. So particularly, I could talk at length really about uh, the small little things like uh, non-canonical amino acids and things that are required for us to get this job done. But um, in, in general, uh, you know, we're working towards it. I guess that's my main take home there. Uh, I love the participation of your cat in our discussion. That's so good. Yeah. Now we have an alpha fold video as well as a cat video. <laughs> I tried to get her away, but. <laughs> uh, awesome. So another YouTube question that is very relevant to what you just said. 
and I would invite anybody to jump in uh, answering that question, is you know how do we know that the structure that we're looking at and trying to predict is a stable structure? Like it's not just a transient structure that has dynamics going on. Like what's the thinking there? Um, yeah, Sydney, you could probably really address that. Um, could you just repeat the question for me? So, so essentially, uh, Pankaj is asking, how do we know that the protein folding has reached the terminal state, like it is in a steady state? And Chris also mentioned that usually proteins can still be have dynamic, like they have they have done some folding, but is is that the state that we're trying to predict, or essentially is folding a dynamic state? or is it a fixed state that you're trying to predict, essentially? OK, got it. Um, so I think uh, you know, uh, Chris alluded to the fact that proteins are dynamic. They're flexible. Um, but the way I like to talk about proteins is they have a memory. Um, there's something about the, uh, the primary or one-dimensional sequence of that protein that encodes a three-dimensional structure. And I should uh, make a clarifying statement here. If you're to just take a random protein, you know, just pull out a, a sequence of amino acids out of a bag, um, chances are it's not going to fold. Chances are it would be a disordered protein. So nature has been able to evolve proteins that are stable, that have a specific three-dimensional fold. Um, these are the types of proteins that we're talking about right here. Um, functional proteins, uh, these proteins that uh, have encoded a three-dimensional stable structure. Um, now, this program, AlphaFold, and the whole competition for the critical assessment of structure prediction, they aren't so much interested in the folding process them itself. It's not concerned with the dynamic nature of proteins. Um, it's a, and what's, what is very nice about it, as Chris had mentioned as well, it's a very specific question. And so um, the specific question is, how does the uh, sequence determine the three-dimensional structure? And it doesn't matter how it reaches that structure. Now, um, as, a, as a member of the Folding, the protein folding community, you know, I did a lot of work uh, computationally using molecular dynamics. One, there's many things that we're looking for. Is there, can you be able to um, identify mechanistic uh, ways in which proteins fold? Do they nucleate uh, and then kind of grow a nucleus around it? Or does the, does the secondary structures, do the alpha helices form and beta sheets form and then they kind of collapse together? Um, these kind of questions are not addressed by uh, protein structure prediction. It's purely, uh, can you uh, predict the three-dimensional structure, the end goal, the end product? Um, and again, so there, there has to be um, some property of those protein sequences that would uh, make them amenable to this, to this particular problem. Um, a random, as I mentioned earlier, a random protein sequence is likely not going to fold to a given uh, three-dimensional structure. But that would be an in interesting question for the alpha fold team. Um, if you generate, if you had a computer generate millions or billions of random sequences, uh, could you identify any of those that have uh, that would actually fold to a particular structure? And, and what is that structure? Um, but uh, to fundamentally address the question, are these proteins uh, stable uh, structures, uh, any biologically relevant sequence is most likely going to be uh, stable. Now, there are, there are some proteins that are a class of protein called intrinsically disordered proteins. Um, perhaps they only fold up into a specific structure when they uh, interact with other proteins. Um, so they could actually act like as a switch or uh, something like that. Um, 
but there are definitely biological proteins that are intrinsically disordered um, in, to be able to find out the, the structures of those proteins and to be able to assign a function to them is probably going to be outside of the uh, application domain of this particular uh, solution. Um, as, a, as I mentioned, that would be a, a deeper level of the onion. Um, I kind of, I think I'll just kind of rest on my case right there and uh, see if there anybody else has anything addition in addition to add. Uh, I add one thing. Uh, you also address the next question from uh, an, a YouTube audience who was asking about disordered uh, proteins. So thank you for that. Uh, let's uh, let's actually move on to the methodology because I'm I'm that. That section of the blog post was a massively vague articulation of a bunch of buzzwords. It has used graph, it has used attention, sequence models. Kerry, what do we know about this? What's our best guess? Yeah, so um, in AlphaFold 1, um, sorry, is there something? Yeah, so in AlphaFold 1, right, um, the input to the model right, where the features that were generated uh, for every residue and you have, you know, for every pair of residues, you have a feature, right? And they created also features based on um, a multiple sequence alignment, like Matteo uh, stated in the beginning. And then they had convolution, like uh, similar to ResNet, multiple layers. I think it was around 220 ResNet layers. So that's a, quite a massive model. Um, 64 by 64 convolu uh, dilated convolutions, and um, then they 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 predicted the um, histograms, so the distribution of the pairwise distance between every residue in the protein, and then they ran a optimization uh, gradient descent to find the angles of the backbone, uh, the torsion angles of the backbone to minimize to fit the distance that they. Um, obtained, right? So they had two steps. One is to compute the pairwise distance, and then after they compute the pairwise distance, you find the angles that fit that distribution, right? So uh, that algorithm, they claim it, it took um, five days to five days to run uh, on average uh, using eight GPU workers. Um, in this new model over here, um, the main thing to uh, see is that they have no mention of convolutions at all. It looks like they um, they replace that with the attention mechanism. With an attention mechanism is is very similar to um, what you have in in uh, some graph neural networks, in that the um, that you have as an input an unordered, um, sorry, lost my screen. Yeah, that you have an input of of uh, of a set, not not of any particular sequence or not of a particular like image where you have some structural data, but just you know a set, you know a set of nodes connected uh, to all other nodes, right? And you aggregate them in a certain way based on the features of those nodes and. Attention does that, right? You, your the weights are not fixed. They're, the weights are dependent on the on the features of the interacting residues, right? So um, we we see that the computational time has increased dramatically with this attention mechanism. Um, we can see that they claim on their blog post that it takes um, a few weeks uh, for sixteen TPUs to. To, to run a typical computation for this, which is a kind of a massive uh, um, massive increase in computational time. And we can speculate that this is just due to uh, them taking away convolution um, uh, as, uh, completely and, and replacing it with attention mechanism. And you see in the blog post, if you just search uh, for convolution, you don't even find the word convolution in in the blog post so that that's something that we can we we can assume and you know maybe a bit uh, too speculative whether they use any you know graph neural network techniques in it or not but that's really a moot point because like i said 
you know, transformers uh, are, can be basically phrased or special, uh, can be looked at as a special kind of, uh, of a graph neural network. Thank you, Karim. Uh, that was uh, illuminating for sure. So uh, th the question of computational complexity is definitely interesting, and, and you brought it up, uh, and it relates to computational cost, obviously. Uh, so, you know, all, uh, I guess, the three folks here with computational chemistry slash biology backgrounds, you know, have trained models probably, and, you know, done physics-based uh, models to, to predict uh, the, the structure of proteins before. Uh, what are your thoughts on the complexity slash, you know, the computational ability that we have now that has enabled uh, AlphaFold 2 that we didn't have before? Is, is that what has made the difference or is it something inherently different about the model that is enabling us to get better results here? Uh, I can talk a little bit just quickly about um, some of the data that is input that really provides these models to excel. And having 3D structures of known proteins is a big part of it uh, as inputs. Um, but also having sequence data provides you with vast amounts of information. So as we've uh, sequenced more and more organisms, we've gained information about um, proteins across you know, the, all, all life on Earth. And having information about what changes across two related proteins really gives you indirect and encodes hidden information about 3D structure. So uh, this method, you know, is really data driven, um, and the computational cost has, you know, largely, you know, related to encoding a lot of that hidden information in sequence and structure data sets into some really, you know, I would say simple and condensed representations. So it's that that's really the core challenge there, converting what data we have available. And hopefully, as, as you know, DeepMind has demonstrated, this type of data we know about in the uh, in the natural world is representative enough, uh, it's useful enough as is to give us a shortcut on top of, you know, what of maybe were some conventional, very expensive methods like physics-based methods. Maybe Sydney could elaborate on, you know, what would it cost or what would the computational cost be to fold a protein with purely physics-based methods? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, if you're talking um, to uh, uh, predict the actual folding process, you know, there's, <laughs> it can take weeks um, just running a, si a single simulation. And um, you know, that's what uh, folding at home really uh, moved the the whole folding community forward and being able to take ensemble approaches, you just by brute force, you send a lot of uh, simulations forward and you hope that based on statistics that a few of those will fold in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but uh, that's, that's not something that um, it's not something that you can really use physics-based modeling from a ab initio folding perspective. You, uh, you know, you, you have to have, um, you have to be, be smarter than that. <laughs> you go straight to the, uh, to the end structure rather than finding out the process. There's lots to learn about the, the folding process itself, but, um, I do feel like, you know, the taking all the knowledge that is currently known uh, has shown to, as the results of this, these competitions have shown, it's proving to be a superior point than rather understanding the physics of the process um, and then building upon that one layer on top of the other. Um, definitely, and, and the advent of deep learning, uh, these uh, very deep networks where you can have multiple layers of perception, um, that is that is actually an interesting um, advantage, I think, to uh, to these methods because fundamentally proteins have multiple layers of structure. Uh, you have the secondary structural elements like alpha helices, uh, beta sheets, and then those fold to get uh, come together to fo uh, to form three dimensional folds. Um, and these deep neural networks the different layers of the networks can then come together, like maybe this particular uh, 
layer of the network can identify alpha helices really well and what are the related sequences that can form that particular type of helix whether it's an alpha helix or a three a 310 helix or a, a pi helix and maybe this other layer uh portion of the layer can identify a, a beta sheet is it a parallel beta sheet is it an anti-parallel beta sheet and these are these would be at low levels of the uh of the deep learning network but then higher levels of those networks can identify this is a helix and this is a sheet and now we have higher level motifs and these motifs then come together at different layers of the network to be able to identify the, the fold in its entirety. Um, it, uh, even though you're, we're not necessarily using physical methods directly, it does appear like these deep neural networks are able to learn what those physical properties are. Now, the interesting question to me is then from the uh, the models of the uh, the deep learning models that AlphaFold has learned from the training set, could we understand each level, each layer of these uh, of these deep uh, these deep layers? Can we understand which one of these layers is going to uh, identify an alpha helix and then be able to assign a certain set of uh, amino acids in a sequence that would make that particular uh, alpha helix? Uh, can we kind of identify certain motifs that are going to be very um, that then we could then des design certain sequences to go to that motif? It's like uh, if, if you're learning, uh, if you take the image recognition problem and you want to identify and to distinguish between a dog and an elephant and a cow. Um, can you then identify the deeper layers of the network that's going to help you to distinguish these different types of animals? Um, I think it's uh, in some ways um, the, the the method that uh, deep uh, that Alpha Fold has used. In some ways, they have turned it the biological problem back into an image recognition problem, and. Uh, you know, because these distance matrices, you can, they're, they're just basically a matrix, just much like an image. And then you can, if uh, Kareem mentioned these uh, convolutions uh, in alpha fold one, um, that al allows you to kind of zoom in into different parts of the, uh, of that helix, of the uh, distance matrix. And alpha helices have a very distinct pattern in the dist distance matrix. A uh, uh, beta sheet has a very distinct pattern. And if you can, uh, build a model that is rec able to recognize very distinctly these different um, patterns that represent specific uh, protein uh, structural um, pieces, um, then that is a very, that, that to me, that shows that there's a lot of promise to that method. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely feel like by taking all of the, all the known knowledge be it, we can be able to then be able to solve the problem, but then there's a lot of digging to into those details to be able to understand the physics, uh, the physical principles uh, that then govern the overall process. Definitely. Thank you, Sid. Uh, Just a couple of points very quickly about computation. So I, I have in, I don't know how the cost of AlphaFold 2 will scale with larger and larger proteins, but I can imagine that you know if you have a fairly large protein, Again, as, as Sid said, with simulation, it's very challenging. I mean, um, it might not be feasible at all. I don't know how many en you know, entries in, in CASP trying to use physics-based you know, simulation to fold the proteins there are. So th this is where probably you know, AlphaFold 2 is enabling in the sense that you would not be able to simulate the folding of a very large protein, whereas you might be able to just get the structure. At the same time, I guess that the advance, or I would guess the advance is not just computation, but a lot of different bits and pieces. You know, as we discussed before, there's a lot of knowledge in the protein structure prediction community about how multiple sequence alignment is useful. And I think AlphaFold, you know, very cleverly, they, they, they use that, they didn't start from scratch. Um, and also, if we think about computation, you know, the improvement, yes, we have more computation than AlphaFold 1, but I think this is also coupled with the tricks of attention, with the tricks of, you know, getting the feature, extracting the features from the sequence alignment as opposed to, you know, the, 
feature engineering. So I think there are a lot of bits and pieces about methods uh, and you know in machine learning that came together with knowledge about you know this problem before as well with computation. So I think computation is one aspect of it, but not the only one probably. Hey, perfect. So if I want to summarize, this is what I understood. Uh, so I guess Chris mentioned better data uh, has definitely contributed. Uh, and Sid and Matteo both talked about how uh, a different approach to the problem, you know, based on extracting features or treating them. Uh, and, and, and as Karim also uh, summarized very well, uh, like moving on to attention-based models, which have been performing quite well in, uh, you know, other tasks like natural language processing and more recently vision uh, have, have made a difference. So a bunch of small improvements here and there has given us a significant improvement. On that topic, let's move on to the impact. So uh, we talked about the results before. It's an impressive result, at least for a subset of problems that we are interested in. As we talked about, uh, I liked how Sid put it, the outer layer of an onion is peeled now. Uh, and OK, so let's see now what. Obviously, they had to bring up COVID. Uh, because you know that's what everybody's talking about this year. So what's uh, like, and there are a few questions on on YouTube as well that are asking about okay, what does it mean for other, you know, biological problems? Like, what does it mean for studying RNAs, for example? Uh, what does it mean for drug discovery? So let's let's have a discussion about that. Uh, maybe we can start with Chris, uh, and then everyone else can chime in. Yeah, sure. On the application side, I see it uh, mostly being applied towards two types of problems, in my opinion. There's understanding the 3D structure of the drug targets themselves. For example, you can't often, uh, you. Uh, it's more difficult to design drugs if you don't really know the shape of what you're doing. People have done it very successfully. Lots of drugs on the market, we actually don't have any idea of what the shape is of the drug target or how it works once we ingest it. But there is certainly, it makes the life of a drug discovery um, team easier if they can really inspect and look at the grooves, at the pockets, at the motion of a particular drug target. And for that, you could really imagine uh, this method being able to open up doors where it might previously have been very difficult to solve a 3D structure. There's a certain class of 3D structures like membrane proteins or certain things that are indeed flexible, which really do have a uh, bring challenges to experimentalists and where scientists have to go in blind, more or less. So, you know, that's just, that is to say, there are some proteins that are very well understood. For maybe 20 years, we've known 3D structure of a certain drug target for which there are still no drugs. But, um, you know, it really is the good initial starting point. It really lays the foundation for what may be a lot of missed opportunities in the whole field of drug discovery. For example, you may not have been able to go forward with a certain project uh, before where you could now go ahead with it. And I think on the COVID-19 example, you know, DeepMind was already in tune with that uh, and they already released actually the, the AlphaFold predictions for all the proteins that exist within the viral capsid. So, um, you know, there's lots of drugability options there, but there's really <laughs> infinite possibilities there too. In some sense, there's just too much to do. Like uh, you could really have one protein and attack it from all sorts of different sides. So, you know, it's really the beginning. I should say like the way in which AlphaFold helps is still very self-contained to this narrow sliver of the earliest stages of drug discovery, which kind of makes the whole thing a bit challenging, but it does give us optimism for things that may have been too tough before. And when I said it, there was two categories, and I'm talking a lot here. It's really about then understanding the 3D structure of the drugs themselves. Um, you know, you can, of course, understand the drug targets. They have a 3D shape, but there is a class of drugs like protein therapeutics. Some of the most uh, valuable drugs in the world are biologics, like antibodies that are very similar to the antibodies in our immune system when we are exposed to pathogens. So we can often take those type of antibodies, produce them in mass quantities, and administer them to, to patients who don't have those uh, that immune system response. And that's another opportunity, really, where you could see if the AlphaFold methods are sensitive to very subtle changes, maybe even as subtle as a single amino acid change, you might actually be able to tune and fine tune specific parts. Now, that's also kind of like a big step maybe in the future, 
towards being able to tune those very specific positions because uh, you know, amino acid of uh, count of a protein might be somewhere like thousands, whereas maybe only three or four amino acids make the difference between a good drug and a bad drug. So we're getting to like the fine details now if you really want to do drug discovery. And it requires, of course, not just computational methods, but a whole team of experimental scientists. But, uh, you know, in general, I think about this, these, these problems a lot and working in, in, in synergy with existing drug discovery teams and kind of building the new workflows that might not have existed otherwise. So, yeah, yeah. Great. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I would uh, agree with Chris in the sense that it's a great starting point. Of course, the application right now with, you know, AlphaFold 2 specifically that I see is fairly narrow. Uh, as we discussed, you know, you might not be able to design a protein with it. Um, and also it's, it's important to remember that having a structure it can help you to understand function, but it's not that once you have structure, you understand function. You know, there are still a lot of studies to be doing. It's like one piece of the puzzle. It's you know a piece of information which is useful, uh, but it's not necessarily the end goal. And also when we discuss about drug discovery, as Chris said, I think it might be enabling for some projects, but of course, like, and it might also speed up sometimes when you are trying to resolve this, uh, these structures experimentally, it helps to have a starting point, which might not be the best starting point, but it helps you speed up the process. So it might be that it it, it, it can help. Again, it's, it's not alone is going to solve their discovery. You know, if you put it in a very large context like that, is it going to revolutionize drug discovery? I don't think so alone, in particular as AlphaFold 2 it is now. But in general, it might provide a lot of interest. It's a bit like this ImageNet moment, right? So it's not like AlexNet solved computer vision single-handedly, but it attracted a lot of attention and then a lot of development, you know, Will, will build upon it. So as I see AlphaFold 2 right now, it might be a bit too narrow. Uh, and again, like drug discovery goes over 12 years and, you know, protein structure prediction uh, and solving a protein structure might be a, a war, you know, work that you do across a few months. So it's not going to cut in half the sort of pipeline of drug discovery, but it might shave off a few months. Um, but again, like if this evolves in a more complex, you know, uh, ecosystem of, you know, deep learning models for protein design, for, you know, again, drug discovery, predicting also not just the protein structure, but how stable the structure is, as we discussed before. You know, you want to give two sequences, they might fold, but which one is the better one? Which one is the more stable? So there is a lot of potential additional work that can build upon it. So I guess it's good to keep the balance, I feel. So it's, a, you know, it's, you know, the protein structure prediction problem, I think is, I agree to say that it is solved but it doesn't necessarily solve biology or drug discovery uh, by itself. Thank you so much. So uh, hopefully that answers quite a few of our YouTube questions. So hopefully Biri, Karen, Mario, Andreas have got some answer to that question. And we have only less than five minutes left. So let's look into the future. Uh, so they talk about the impact of this work on researchers. So they say they might make this available to researchers. Uh, and, you know, there's also a, a question from Dennis, who's, you know, probably going one step further thinking, you know, what if we automated trying out some of the predicted structures in the lab? I guess Chris, uh, you know, talked about collaboration with, uh, you know, experimentalists. So if I may ask each four of you to very quickly in less than a minute, maybe summarize what, what you hope to see in the future that is coming up. Um, I can uh, take a stab at that. Um, and this is something that I've uh, mentioned uh, in some of my other comments. Um, i'm I'm excited for the next step the next stage or the next level um, with the inverse folding problem, um, being able to then design novel uh, proteins um, with novel functions. Um, that's where biotechnology, to me, really gets exciting. Um, you know, that's, their synthetic biology has been a discipline that really emerged about 15, 10 to 15 years ago. And um, being able to then um, build upon the, the impact for the synthetic biology community uh, with the next la layer of the inverse folding problem, being able to ba basically make designer proteins with uh, very specific uh, biotechnology applications. To me, that's very exciting. 
so I'd like to take another stab. So I'm out of place here, as you know, I'm not a biologist, but uh, what's exciting about this, uh, about AlphaFold 2 is they took a very difficult molecular um, dynamics problem, right? And basically trying to uh, get the final result of that, of a simulation that you would carry out, right? In a much shorter time than it would have taken if you did, you know, ab initio uh, simulation from scratch, right? And so what I'm excited to see is how does this, um, these techniques that they have developed, uh, you know, using transformers in a, in a unconventional manner, uh, so far unconventional manner, you know, uh, maybe it would be conventional later to solve these uh, hard uh, minimization problems that could potentially be applied to many areas in, in physics and chemistry. Uh, doesn't matter who goes first. Yeah, I'll go first. So uh, certainly I'm most excited about the function side of things. You know, once you make a protein structure, you could think about um, going end to end towards that uh, functional annotation side. And there are actually competitions. There's a critical assessment of a function annotation and something we have called gene ontology, which helps us understand what the role is of a certain protein within the biochemical networks of the body. The whole body itself is a complicated network of all these pathways intersecting. So taking a bigger stab, like increasing the difficulty, going beyond that 3D structure into the bigger picture would really give you a better understanding of, uh, you know, if the proteins you're creating are, are, are useful for any purpose. And, you know, I shouldn't set the bar so high. Like we should make sure at first we validated and seen how extendable and how, you know, the breadth of structures which we can solve uh, with a method like AlphaFold 2. And maybe that we're still kind of in a cloud around the points that we know about. And that's really just still in a vast ocean of possibilities for protein structures. So assessing that, of course, as a scientist, you want to see that, you know, reproducibility and understanding of the method uh, established first. But on top of that, I'm most excited in the future about function. Yeah, I would, uh, again, I, I agree with Chris and Sydney. I think what I find most exciting, as I said, I think the immediate application can be helping experimentalists resolve structures of previously, previously unknown proteins. And, you know, going a step further, I think the aspect of, you know, designing protein therapeutics or being able to even just have a starting point that, you know, it's, you know, it falls in a certain way and it's stable, it, it can be a, a good advance for, you know, therapeutics. So from a scientific perspective, I find this very uh, exciting. From a more, let's say, social perspective, I'm hoping that they will release the code uh, for everybody to use and they will not uh, license it. Again, I, I, they probably have to think about it. I don't see it as having like a massive commercial, uh, you know, interest from, from, you know, for a company like Google right now, but it might be very useful for structural biologists if, if this was available to them. Uh, for free. So I, I hope they will release the code, um, you know, for everybody to use. Thank you so much, uh, all four of you. Uh, again, joining us on a, such a short notice and giving us all uh, valuable insight. Uh, thanks to the audience for joining us as well. Uh, please go to AI.Science, create an account to get notified about uh, events like this and a lot of content like that. Uh, thank you so much and hope to see you soon. Thank you, all the panelists. Thanks, Thanks to you, Amir.